Well, a good morning to all of you here today. Morning. We're taking a look. My message today is short. Uh, we're doing something a little different today. Uh, take a look at your Bibles, the book of Philippians, chapter 3. Book of Philippians, chapter 3. Father in heaven, you give us so much in your word to look upon, reflect upon, learn from. May this morning, in its totality, be a blessing. The music's been a blessing to us and our fellowship together. As we continue on in every part of this service, may your spirit prevail in every heart, in every way. We thank you. We know you're God. You're in control. <coughs> give me now the words to speak to make things clear and concise and may everybody have understanding and receptive hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, and I'm not going to dissect all these verses because it is a short message today. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had something in your life that was really, really important to you, that you put time and effort into, you protected, you watched over it, and it was, at that point of your life, something that was very endearing to you? But later on, as the years grow by, and, and, uh, and the young people may not be able to grasp this as much as us folks that have some years on us, but you go by in years, and you look back, and you kind of shake your head over the fact that you admired whatever it was in your life that was so important at the time, and now it's of no grand importance whatsoever. <laughs> but you realize you spent a lot of time and effort in that. Now you've changed. What would happen if your change was permanent? What would happen if what you really thought was so wonderful years ago, you purposely gave up? Not just that years got you, but you purposely gave it up because you realized it wasn't what you needed. But what you needed was something else that now you grasped hold of and that you know that from now, or whenever you grasped hold of this new area of life, until the very day you die, it will remain the most important thing to you. You, that you've got. The Apostle Paul talks about that in his life. Something that was of uttermost importance to him, that put him at the cream of the crop socially, that was so important that he gave it up. To find something that was much better, he took to the end of his life. Take a look at this in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 4. Paul says this, Though also I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. you got to focus on something. Paul is talking about his body. He's talking about what he accomplishes physically. We live in a society today uh, that is inundated with the physicalness. When you watch our young people today, uh, I, I've always enjoyed sports. I've been involved in sports. I've coached sports. But you know what I, what I see now? Sports is overtaking other things that used to be important like music, intelligence things of this nature I watch it and it saddens my heart for as much as I enjoy sports and I enjoy, it, I enjoy being part of the sports program I enjoy coaching it's like wait a minute something is out of whack. And then I watch in our society, not only as to what young people accomplish, how fast, how strong, how smart they are, then you, you look at the fronts of magazines and how they are exploiting uh, the young women of today. And I, as I think back about a fine young lady uh, in a state that I pastored, and uh, she was in, in a helper in, the, in one of the sports programs. A, a lovely young lady. And uh, and, and I say this so you can understand this. If I had been, uh, if I was a teenager in that school system and I was looking to take a young lady to an event, a young lady, and I'm, I'm talking only physically when I say this, a young lady that I would feel good to, to have alongside me, she would be one. She was a really nice looking gal. And I got to talk to her. I used to ask the young people a question uh, in order to... Um, <coughs> bring out Jesus Christ to them. And I said to her, how, how much are you worth? How much are you worth? You know what her answer was to me? About that much. 
Now here's a fine young lady, intelligent, nice looking young lady. How much are you worth about that much? I finally squeezed, squeezed out of her why she said that. And he, you know what her answer was? Because I'm fat. Now I want to let you know something. This girl wasn't fat. I'm not making this up. She wasn't. But you know what she's been doing? Looking at all the very thin models. She had to be. All these real skinny gals. And it sets up this precedence. And so we see the physical things of this earth become something that sets up a standard for people to go by. Whether I'm a great athlete or whether I'm good looking or, or whatnot. Uh, fellas, answer this. To, so, so, all right. What do you guys answer this? Fellas. What's the perfect height to be? What's a height that guys really wish they could attain? You know, height. How tall do you wish, you know, if you were a guy? How, how tall? What's the answer, guys? Five foot seven. Height <laughs> 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 <Hi, they> are. <laughs> guys, you know the answer. Six feet, right? I've had guys tell me, they, I remember guys standing there looking at me right in the eyes. He says, well, I'm six feet tall. I said, well, you can't be. I'm five, nine, half. You can't be five, nine, half. I'm six feet tall. But you're not six feet tall. But it's like, you know, if you're if I'm six feet tall, I'm, I'm complete. Steve, no, I'm straight. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, we do this. Now, look what yeah, Paul I says. Head when I did it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He's six foot. He's six foot. Right. No, yeah, yeah, hair on your head, right? Uh, by, by, the, by the way, can we take up an extra offering today? i got to go to the hair club for men because mine. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Paul, Paul had great confidence in the flesh. Now, here's why. Now, he lived in a society, he was Jewish, he lived in a society where being correct in the religious world was important, but to be correct in, in that religious world, there were certain things you did physically. Look at the, I'm just going to give you a list. Starting at verse 5, here's what he says. In verse 5 of chapter 3, he said, I'm circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. That was really, really important to them. Not only to be circumcised, but it had to be done on the eighth day. And he says, all that was perfect for me. He said, I'm of the stock of Israel, meaning I am not a half-breed I'm just using that term to try to get you to understand. Well, I'm of the stock of Israel. Oh, I'm pure blood. He said, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, and Benjamin and, and uh, Joseph were the only two children of Rachel. And they, and they were kind of like, a, you know, if you're going to be of a tribe, that, that's like one of the elite tribes by name to, be, to belong to. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, meaning that when the children of Israel had been captured and taken from land, a place like that, the, of me, I didn't become, if I was told off to another country, I didn't become like them. I maintained who I was as a Jewish person, speech and everything else. And so he's building this platform for himself of how great of a person he was in all aspects of all their religious efforts uh, in life. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrew. In other words, I have stood the test of time. I'm still acting like a Hebrew. Nobody has taken that away from me. I am that way. It'd be like somebody who is really set in their minds that it's really, really important to profess that you're a Baptist. To say, I want to let you know I've been a Baptist for years. I'm a, and no matter how many Baptist churches haven't gone the right way, I've been a Baptist, a real good Baptist all my life. I'm a Baptist of Baptists. <laughs> he says he's a Pharisee. It was the next thing. And he says he's a Pharisee, meaning this, that the Pharisees were a group of elite people who really focused on the law of God and they focused on obeying the law of God to the uttermost efforts. They tried to dissect every little piece. In other words, they wanted to be spirit, they wanted to be religiously, politically correct in everything that they did. And, and you know how, how sometimes lawyers will will uh, pick apart what did you mean by saying this? And, and you know, they tried to define, define, define. Well, that's what the Pharisees did. They defined and defined and defined the religious laws. One of the things that they found out years ago, and I don't know if it was before or after Paul's time, uh, you know, they, they had the, the Sabbath. They just give you an idea about the Pharisees. They, you had the Sabbath day. You couldn't work on the Sabbath day. 
but they want to know what could you do on the Sabbath day. So how far could you walk from your house to any place on the Sabbath, what was permitted and what wasn't? Well, they come up with the idea that you could walk any place that was your personal property. So, in other words, if you had a yard, you could walk in your yard. If you had an acre, you could walk an acre. If you had two acres, you walked two acres. But what happens if you wanted to walk further than that? So before the Sabbath day, if they wanted to walk, uh, say, three miles or something like this, they'd take a pair of their shoes, their sandals, and they'd carry them to another place. So that then on the Sabbath day, it was religiously correct for them that they could walk there because that's where their personal property was. One of the questions was, was it wrong to draw water out of the well on a, on a Sabbath day? Because they wanted to get this correct. You know, so they're discussing this. Well, it would be an effort for man to draw water out of the well on the Sabbath day. But what would happen if you need water? So they found out, they agreed that it wasn't wrong for a girdle to support a lady on the Sabbath day. So they would hook the, the girdle to the rope to the bucket, and that made it correct to pull the, the water out of the well on the Sabbath day. So understand that the, that the, that the Pharisees were a, they, they defined everything. And he is saying, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. In other words, in every strictest, rulest way that we discovered and, and figured things out, I am. This is who I am. This is, and this was important to Paul. This was really, really, really important to him because that established in his mind who he was in this social structure. And he strove and he strove and he strove for this. He said concerning zeal and persecuting the church because I understand that the church was anti-everything he was because what Paul was doing and that other people did as Pharisees, and he was called Saul at the time, was this. They were using their physical accomplishments and achievements to get their way to heaven and to consider that they earned their way to heaven, that they had a place with God in his kingdom based on their achievements and their accomplishments and their goals. And he said that concerning zeal, he said, he persecuted the church. He had people put in prison. He had people put to death. In other words, nothing's going to stand up against what's important to me, my accomplishments in the flesh. This is what I'm going to do. And he said, I persecuted the church. And he said, concerning touching the law, blameless. Meaning nobody could say, well, Saul, which we call now Paul. Yeah, he's a good Pharisee, but there's a couple little areas he's not quite right. No, he said, I'm blameless. Nobody can put their finger against me and say he wasn't right. That's how strict, that's how tight, that's how important this was to him. And now look at verse 7. <laughs> But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. All of this, everything I just told you about myself, Hebrew of the Hebrews, I'm, you know, circumcised just the correct day, and, 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 and the tribe of Benjamin, and all my zeal, and all this stuff, and, and, and blameless, he said, I count it a loss. I, was, I throw it away. That's not who I am anymore. It's gone. I'm not pursuing that. Why? For, this, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Now, I wanted to define something here. And so let's look down at, uh, at the next scripture, verse 8. He said, Yes, indeed, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So he made it very clear. Jesus Christ is now the most important thing in his life. or well, not thing, person. And... He is now striving for that. Everything he had before, the platform in life, the social structure, the power, everything he had, he said, that's gone. I am not pursuing that. I got him a loss. He said, this is what is now. This is my new life. This is what I'm going to live and die with, and it's Jesus Christ. And notice why. In the very next verse, 9, and, being, and be found in him not having my own righteousness. He said, I am nothing. In other words, what I accomplish myself is nothing. It does not count. He said, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is, which is from God by faith. Two things. Notice, which is through faith in Christ. His, what he now had, was by his faith in Christ. Notice his faith in Christ, the next word, the next thing, the righteousness which is from God by faith. It's by God. 
So it's by Jesus Christ, it's by God. What do we have? We have God the Heavenly Father that, that looked at all of mankind and knew that salvation had to come to him to where mankind could have total forgiveness from all of his sins, past, present, and future. And so God the Heavenly Father gave Jesus Christ to die on the cross for everyone. Saul of Tarsus, who became named later on as Paul, was one of them. His name would be put on the cross as one of those people that Jesus Christ died for. In totality, every area of, of, of Paul's life. And because God opened up Paul's eyes, who was then called Saul, opened up his eyes to, that, to the realization of who he was, he then saw the, put his trust and faith in Jesus Christ, that he, that Jesus Christ alone could wash away all of his sins, and that all of his religious achievements in life meant nothing. But through Jesus Christ, it was everything. And then the next verse clarifies that even more, because look at this. In verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Why is the resurrection so adamant and so important? Because if Jesus Christ stayed dead, we would die and stay dead. But Jesus Christ rose from the grave, giving life to people who put their trust and faith in him. And guess what? Those people who become Christians, such as Saul, later named Paul, is in heaven today. Why is that? Because God forgave him for everything, past, present, and future. When Jesus Christ died on that cross, he, he gave his blood. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, was perfect. And because it was perfect, he could actually take everybody's sins of the whole world, from the first person, Adam, and then the second person, Eve, to the last individual who we don't know which one of these to be born here on this earth that Jesus Christ saw all their sins and the mountains and mountains and mountains and mountains of the sins and paid for them all. Mm -hmm. And when a person puts their trust and faith in Jesus Christ, in that whole pile of mountains of sins, which Ken Wagstaff has his mountain there, he forgave me. And when God opened up my eyes, I put my trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Guess what? That forgiveness was mine. For that alone, gives me the privilege to go home to be with God someday because he forgave me, which he did for all of us. Paul had something in his past, all his accomplishments and achievements, and didn't do anything for him. And then when he realized that it didn't, and Jesus Christ was the only way, that was what he had, and he was going to take to his grave with him, his trust and, trust and faith in Jesus Christ. So the question is, is how about you? Where did you stand with him? We have a great privilege today. And the great privilege is one of our brothers, two of our brothers in the Lord, are going to get up and, and share from their hearts what God has given to them to share. So we're going to ask them to come up as however they have decided to do that. And before they do that, let me pray for them. Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Would you bless both Ed and Steve and put within their hearts and mouths the words that you have them to speak and share with the people here this morning. And may the people, Lord God, understand the hearts from which it comes. In Jesus' name, amen.